with science enthusiasts, welcome to Science Chat. Every week we bring an amazing expert to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. This week we have Michael Meyer, a research geographer and ecologist, and Michael's been to Siberia, and, 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 and we're going to get into that today. Um, Michael was actually a guest on the Science Podcast a couple of years ago, and we are thrilled to have him back. So without further ado, Michael... Welcome to Science Chat on Twitter. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be back. Yay. <laughs> um, now, without giving away your exact location, where where are you oh, in the gosh. world? Well, I actually, uh, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, back in the Midwest. Back in the Midwest. Now, uh, Michael, what do you, your, your, your title has changed since the podcast. What do you actually classify yourself? Like what kind of scientist Ooh, would you classify? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so I've I, I finished my PhD in Washington State, and like you know, pre, it's it's like that that dichotomy of what do you call yourself and what is um, on the contract that you signed. And <laughs> okay, yeah. um, when I started my new job, so I call myself a data intensive freshwater scientist. Right. Okay. Um, and my official job title, um, I'm a Mendenhall Fellow with the U.S. Geological Survey, um, but my and my official title is research geographer, um, which basically means I work with large spatial data, or not even large sometimes, but just spatial data. Gotcha. Now, what's your? Are you done your education, or are you continuing it with research? So um, I have completed my formal education. I actually graduated with uh, the, you know, the floofy hat and the the robes um, a few weeks ago. But, oh, congratulations! Um, I, oh, thank you, thank you. It was lots of fun. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a postdoc, which is kind of like oh, is that is oh that my goodness. So thing? you're Doctor Michael Myers. I'm I am Doctor Michael Myers. I'm so uh, sorry. Uh, the last time we chatted, you weren't quite done that yet. Oh my gosh. No, no, no. <laughs> well, super Thank congratulations you. on that. Thank you. I think the whole space is here. going to throw you some claps. There we oh go. Gosh. You see them happening? There we go. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks everyone. That's so cute. So you're a postdoc <laughs> now so that you're doing yes. research after your doctor. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, I got a question for you, Michael. I ask this of all the guests we've had on the Science Podcast or in Science Chat. And it's something like um, that's really profound for me as an educator. Mm -hmm. And it's what got you into science? Like what this has been a huge oh. a journey for you. You just don't become a, do a doctor of science on a whim. Yeah. You, so was there something that you can pinpoint that got you into science? Or have you always been into science as a as a person? Um, yeah. Um, wow. Okay. I can think of like two ways of thinking about this. It's yeah. like what like operationally got me into science. <laughs> and I just, like, I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm just curious. <laughs> and what like actually got the energy for science. Um, and the energy for science is like, a, it's kind of corny when I say it. Um, I get, uh, I really enjoy solving, like, this is really what I did in the, in my PhD, right? Through like mm. the more advanced research side. It's like, I really just enjoy solving really complex problems. Um, but like in, in my, the way that I think about it is like when, especially when you're doing this type of research, you're solving problems that like not many people, number one, have even have thought to ask, right. Or like thought that they could get at the answer, um, so like really what keeps me going is like this new, like all of the new things that are going on, um, in the environmental sciences right mm. now. And I'm, like I said, I'm, uh, I classify myself as a data intensive freshwater scientist. So I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, you know, during this, uh, however long we have today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll um, get, we'll get into that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely like this explosion of environmental data that we all, um, have access to literally at our fingertips and we can now start to ask new, like novel questions mm. at like super large spatial and temporal scales. Um, so I'd say what, what like it got the excitement into science was um, this just, this, just this, um, this chance to answer questions mm. that like, you know, no one 30, 40, 50 years ago would have probably thought like that they could answer that type of question and how we would go about it, actually solving those questions. Um, so that's really what excites me. So you're a, are you a puzzle guy? 
Like you like puzzles? Um, actually, no. No I hate puzzles with a passion. <laughs> it's just like oh god. Oh, and, whoops, you know, wrong, wrong question. You, know, you want to know? It's the thing. <laughs> it's like I'm not a craft person because I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this puzzle now? Like oh, I solved it. Like, okay. do I put it back in the box? You know, it's like during the pandemic, I got into woodblock printing. And because, like, you know, pandemic hobbies. Yes. And I'm like, and so I started um, making woodblock prints of zooplankton. And and I was like, what am I supposed to do with this now? Like, there's only so many prints of zooplankton that I need in my, or let me say, let me rephrase that, bad prints of zooplankton <laughs> in my apartment. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. But yeah, sorry. Sorry to be that bubble burster. Well, you know, everybody needs a hobby and... and- <laughs> Um, my first, I build, uh, like people who follow our family know that I build these intricate costumes and my first ones are not great. We're not great at all. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> um, Fair. yeah. So, okay. For your now continuing, um, mm. k- kind of like with the questions, uh, the questions I have continuing, you got to work in Siberia. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because in re-listening to our chat, I could listen to you chat about Siberia for hours. Um, why were you there and what was it like? Yeah. So why was I there? So for that moment, um, I was um, a, a Fulbright fellow, uh, which is basically this fellowship um, funded through the U S uh, department of St- state department. Mm-hmm. And um, it, at that time, or it, like the, the fellowship that I was on was intended to support post baccalaureate um, study or research. Um, and I had worked with a lot of um, it's a lot like that. This is like getting into operationally how I got into science <laughs> uh, where the long story long is like, um, you know, I was that typical like undergrad in biology and um, I learned th- and I wanted to be pre-med and I learned that I really did not like um, uh, <laughs> working with sick people. Mm. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was not something that I wanted to, that I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to, I was more interested in solving the problems. Um, and so I was like, okay, there's this new environmental science thing. I think I can do it. And uh, the long story long is I had an opportunity um, through previous experiences to work at Lake Baikal through this exchange between um, the Russian Federation, Mongolia, and and the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so that got me this internship at Baikal, and then that led to a successive internship at Lake Baikal, and then that led to this Fulbright Fellowship. Um, and so how I got there was this, um, and this was all mediated actually through language exchange. It all started as like um, State Department and Department of Education funded uh, language exchange opportunities. Um And so I got to Lake Baikal and I was more interested in um, protein level stuff, like, you know, the the small building blocks. And I was interested in um, how protein level responses of these organisms that have evolved over the past like 20 million years um, to be in very cold water. So like the average temperature for Baikal is around like six to eight degrees Celsius. Um, and it's Baikal is actually warming um, faster than the air temperature of Siberia. Um, so, you know, these critters, they really don't do well above like 15 degrees Celsius. Mm, okay. So super cold. Um, and so we were looking at how those temperatures uh, were altering their capacity, their protein level expression um, at higher temperatures. Hmm. Um, and like shocker, the ones that really like the cold, like all among all of these critters, like the ones that really like the cold, uh, they don't do well at higher temperatures. <laughs> um, but the ones that are a little more, I'm not even going to say cosmopolitan because like that doesn't, you know, um, <laughs> uh, like, I mean, when I say cosmopolitan, like they can kind of like be anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, Cause they can't, you like know, they're really only sort of. at this. Exactly. Um, the ones that are maybe a little bit more um, um, have that capacity to respond a little bit more robustly, even they start to die off at around 18 degrees Celsius, 20, wow. or 18. So, so this that, is, that, that lake cannot get very hot or they just get cooked. Right. Hmm. Um, which, you know, I mean, we've, we've got a while for that, but like um, that. So that's that's how I got into Lake Baikal study. And that's really what brought me to the table where I was working with the, the near shore critters. Um, these invertebrates and Baikal, you know, we say it's the lake of superlatives, right? Like it's the deepest, it's the most voluminous, it's the, um, the most ancient. It's, uh, and 
I would argue the most biodiverse lake in the world. And like these, these near shore critters. Um, so to date there's 355 known species of amphipod at Lake Baikal. And, um, and, you know, but all of those materials were written in, um, in Russian. So, um, getting that necessarily into like a, an English speaking audience, there's that, there's that gap, right? Mm, and that's gotcha. actually how I got into my, P- that's how I moved into my PhD where, um, so at Washington state where my advisor, she, um, had worked with the Lake Baikal's time series or their zooplankton data sets. And, um, just quick plug for the Baikal zooplankton. Um, it's a very, 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 um, I, I never use this word in science, especially unique. Um, <laughs> I never like to say the word unique. I always say it's very uncommon, but I will call this unique. <laughs> um, it's arguably the longest uh, ecological time series that we have, especially for zooplankton. Um, we're going back to 1945. We have weekly zooplankton counts um, to from, like from life Michael. stage. Yes, to like life stage of critter, not even like species of critter. Wow. Um, and it's really just a mom and it started out as a mom. It's a great story. It started out as a mom and pop operation where it was this guy. And, you know, he um, he started this time series in 1945. He was a researcher at the university. Then his daughter took it over. And when he passed away and then her daughter took it over when she passed away. Um, and then her graduate student took it over when she passed away. Wow. So um, it's really this rich time series um, that is, you know, people like myself who are trained in, or and especially my advisor who work with these, like my uh, PhD advisor, we work with these uh, data intensive methods that are designed for like, not having a lot of data, right? Like we've had to make really complicated statistics to handle like not having the, those rich data resources. Um, however, you know, it's when you get those rich data resources, you don't need the, 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 the fancy statistics um, because it's, it's what we've all dreamed about. It's, you just um, got to, Hey, you have so much data. It's just there. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can work with it. Hmm. And so long, so, th- she, but that was the zooplankton. And she said, I would really like to get involved in the near shore critters. Cause she's been working, she had been working with the offshore. And so that's really how this collaboration at Lake Baikal started where, um, I was this guy looking for a PhD and looking for PhD opportunities and I had expertise and a lot of contacts um, with nearshore um, uh, uh, ecological communities at Lake Baikal. And we had a lot of expertise with like the, the methods as well as the rich offshore community data. Hmm. Um, so hopefully that answers your original question. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, and what blows my mind is just like, okay, your research with these, these nearshore critters is fascinating and all of this data sets really cool. Um, as a, as somebody that had never heard of Lake Baikal, I went down the rabbit hole. Like you, this lake is unbelievable. It's like, it's un, it's just so deep and there's things that live there that don't live anywhere else in the world. Like, um, Mm -hmm. uh, there's a type of seal you talked about that lives around Lake Baikal. Yes. The world's only exclusively freshwater seal. Um, (laughs) I have to get to see it. Did you get to see any? Oh yes. Oh yeah. You you did. um, yeah, you get to see them. I mean, like not necessarily up close, um, um, ex- unless if you go to like the zoo or something like that. Mm, okay. um, but like, especially if you're on the shore, you just like look out and um, and you you know maybe about like two kilometers offshore, you'll see a little head poking out of the water. Um, so oh. and then you'll see the tails when they dive back down. So you took this data um, and you you had some really interesting conclusions, and this this moved forward into your work back in uh, in the United States. Uh, am I on the yeah. right time scale? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and yeah, you were that's, obviously that's... there in the summer, um, or were you there over the winter? <laughs> so, um, a lot of my field work was in the uh, the summer. Right. However, I have worked there in the winter. How'd that go um, for you? Um, you know, hey, you folks, a lot of you folks are in Canada. So like, I can't really say much. But, um, you know, when I moved there, I moved there in September, that was uh, September. So I lived all all in all at Lake Baikal about two ish years, two and a half years. Right. And but um, the, the the joke that I had heard in the beginning was like, Oh, you know, the difference between minus 30 and minus 40. And I was like, Nah, those both seem really cold. And <laughs> no, you then do. I was 
I was waiting for a bus in minus 30 and the next few days it was minus 40 and I'm like, oh, this is very different. Oh, it is a <laughs> minus 20 to minus 30. That is, that's a rough difference. That, that is a very rough difference. Yeah. And then yeah. minus 40 is just everything dies. So oh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't freeze to death. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm a firm believer. Um, it's not about liking the cold. It's about knowing how to dress warm. This is true. Yep. Uh, Canadians in the winter always say that to F for solace. You can mm-hmm. always put on more layers if you're cold, but you wind up, you can only take so many layers off if you're hot. Mm-hmm. Before it becomes socially unacceptable. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you're just joining us and you're like, what's going on? Because Michael, I don't know if you saw the numbers. We've almost got 40 people listening tonight, which is a great oh, my word. Yeah, which is great. It takes me a time to scroll down and see everybody. So thank you for everybody who's here listening. If you're just listening, Science Chat brings you an amazing expert every week. And I have, and I got this wrong at the start. Dr. Michael Meyer. Um, (laughs) Again, congratulations. That's amazing. (laughs) And uh, we're chatting about uh, the docs research. We just finished Siberia talk and let's move back to the United States. We started to work on Mm -hmm. rivers and pharmaceuticals in the water. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So that was actually, um, and actually it um, it was, uh, my, my main focus was on lakes Lakes. and pharmaceuticals. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, as a lake person, you know, we have to (laughs) proclaim our care territory. (laughs) Oh, wow. Thank you. (laughs) Um, yeah. And so a lot of my work, uh, was continuing the work at Lake Baikal, um, but also doing, um, some work at Flathead Lake, uh, which is located in Western Montana near Glacier National Park. Okay. Um, and basically, you know, the main, the main idea is that, um, so sewage pollution is pretty pervasive globally. And, you know, at least when I say sewage pollution, you know, it's not always like, you know, what you envision near a large city. It can also be septic tanks, um, you know, that pretty pervasive. Um, but the thing is like, you know, when you think of like, especially in Canada, right. You think of like those blue, bright blue lakes, um, you know, a little bit of nutrients or like nitrogen and phosphorus in sewage can actually have a pretty strong biological response. Um, because like, like with Baikal, right. Like the organisms in those blue lakes are adapted over millennia, um, not, you know, uh, globally speaking, they've adapted over millennia, um, to like live in these super low nutrient environments. Right. So, so they're, like, they, they're good to go with nothing basically. Yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Thanks. Like, it's like, if you have a detectable concentration in some of these lakes of like phosphorus, that is, that is a sign. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like that's what I'm like, when I say low concentrations, it's like most monitoring programs for these lakes, you're used to getting a signal that's below detection limits. Wow. Okay. okay. Um, so like you can imagine how, you know, like at Lake Baikal, right? Like a village of, you know, 80 people with pretty elementary, um, or, you know, pretty, uh, elementary wastewater treatment practices, you know, that could it potentially elicit some sewage that is detectable within near shore waters. So not, like, not to get crude doc, but you're mm-hmm. talking like, uh, generally people mm-hmm. who live near a lake for the longest mm-hmm. time, when they flush a toilet, it goes out to the lake or it goes to a tank and then out. To um, the lake. yeah. Yeah. Or even, even like a wastewater, tr- some wastewater tr- water treatment plants. Um, just generally, you know, you flush a toilet, um, and it might appear, it will likely appear in whatever water is surrounding it. Okay. Um, and, but the pro- but that's the problem, right? Where like detecting it is actually quite hard. Um, because if we're getting that signature from uh, that like nitrogen and phosphorus, right? That might be in uh, human sewage. That nitrogen and phosphorus can come from numerous non-sewage sources. Um, and it can get pretty complicated. So things like melting permafrost, right? can give us a very similar signature to sewage. Um, uh, things like atmospheric deposition, we can get deposition of nitrogen um, into a system. Like that can give us a similar s- signal as sewage, especially like it comes in, down li- in rain or snow. Yep, exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or agriculture. Great. That's, yeah. that's the, probably yeah. the big one that I miss. Yeah. We know about that. We know about <laughs> that in Canada. That's the, that's the big one that causes those algal blooms. Yep, Exactly. Um, but the thing is like, if we want to actually say that, um, something is related to sewage, we need some marker, right. That Mm. explicitly ties 
the sewage to or the ecological response. Uh, to I know the where sewage, you're going. Right? My light bulb. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And I'll so let you explain it. I just figured it out. I just figured it out. Okay. Pharmaceutical. Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, cause things like anti or anti antibiotics or, um, uh, heart medication, um, tend to come from humans and not from plants around us. I don't think farmers spray um, that on their crops. Well, it's actually interesting. Cause like there's a whole literature of not the farmers necessarily in crops, but for, um, veterinary pharmaceuticals, for cattle, cattle and stuff. um, cattle, that's a completely different suite of pharmaceuticals, um, usually than it is for humans. Um, so we can usually do a pretty good job of assessing what sewage that's coming from humans and what sewage that's coming from like livestock practices. Okay. Um, and so, but the idea is, is like, you know, so I, when I started my PhD, we kind of like stump, this is a really new area of literature, yeah. right? These pharmaceuticals in the environment, like, um, the, for, and so one of the things I did, uh, these data intensive practices is like looking at trends in the publication literature. Um, where it's, and I swear I'll get back to Baikal in, in, in Montana, but, you know, just to impress upon folks, like how new this literature is, um, you know, the first studies that we see talking about this are really in like 1980s, but it's like a blip. It's like one or two. And then it really takes off in 2002 when some folks at the U S geological survey sampled, um, at the continental United States scale for like, how prevalent are these? pharmaceuticals in the nation's rivers. And it turned out they were way more prevalent than anybody thought they would ever be. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, like, you know, like, um, 80, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the exact number off the top of my head, but I think it's about 85% of pharma of samples taken across the country had at least one pharmaceutical in them. Um, so Kind of, that was way higher than any folks thought. And then the question becomes like, are those concentrations actually like biologically consequential, right? Where, you know, sure, you're able to detect it, but is it at a concentration that actually can elicit a response? Um, and so it's really like in 2000, I can, the main one I can think of is like 2012, 2013, uh, like Emma Rossi and her colleagues at the Cary Institute in New York. Um, we're showing that, like, yes, you actually get changes in ecological f ecosystem function at, like, um, looking at, like, what we call it the, it's like community respiration. So, like, how, if you have, like, um, a patch of moss and you were to treat that patch of moss as, like, a human body, like, how much is it actually, like, how much, what's the oxygen production from that patch of moss? Um, and so, or carbon dioxide intake, or carbon di dioxide intake. And, right you actually see um, um, differences in, in, in algae that grows on rocks um, for even concentrations as low as like 10 micrograms per liter. Or I'm sorry, 10 nanograms, 10 nanograms, nanograms. per liter. And this you is like, still, sorry, Doc, this is like random yeah. pharmaceuticals, right? Not like a specific um, it, or... No, oh, like even things like caffeine. Right. Really? Like we all drink caffeine. We yeah, you know, if you drink, drink a coffee, lot of caffeine. Drink, drink a lot of caffeine. <laughs> right. No, like even, you know, and this is not me saying like, oh, wastewater treatment plants and septic tanks need to do a better job. Cause like I'm a firm believer that like the folks who plan wastewater treatment plants, they do amazing work um, to get stuff that comes in at super high concentrations mm -hmm. and have it flow out at super low concentrations. Yes. But even if they get 99.5% of it, you know, what my work is showing, what tons, tons of other work, you know, I stand on the shoulder of giants and like their works. Um, it's that, you know, that 1%, that 0.5% that leaves the waste, however you're handling your wastewater, we still have an ecological response to that. Mm -hmm. So it's affecting the environment. It's affecting yeah, the things that it, are alive. It, exactly, and we don't always know the way that it's gonna that it's gonna go. Like, is it necessarily like a, a deleterious? Like, is it a bad quote bad response? Yeah. Consequence. I, I mean, I, I I reserve those judgments for the people that want to make those judgments. <laughs> but I'm like, the fact of the matter is, we can measure it, and mm -hmm. and that's something that you know, at least ten years ago, um, we wouldn't have necessarily thought. Yeah, I can't imagine um, caffeine with like if the moss has too much caffeine, it's not going to like speed up at how much it moves. 
but it could affect get all like a jittery moss. Oh, hey guys, well, like it's time to do moss stuff way faster than normal. Right. But but obviously Ugh. it could affect the cellular respiration photosynthesis of that organism. So totally. Yeah. And like, you know, and even if like the tropical plants literature, um, like terrestrial plants, you know, plants that produce caffeine use it as a toxicant to like to kill other plants around it. And then humans are like, um, we need to drink this every morning to stay awake. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so there's that, and, you know, and just, you know, there's so much literature on this now, but like what this, the synthesis was about, you know, 7,000 studies for pharmaceuticals in the environment, about 85% of those studies have happened since, since 2015. Um, and it's like, whoa, there's so much out there, but we've been studying it for a pretty short amount of time. Um, the, the relative to the like the whole scientific enterprise, um, there's certain systems we focused on. Most of that literature focuses on rivers as opposed to lakes, where in lakes you might ex- expect these compounds to accumulate and to higher concentrations because like it sits there longer uh, than in a river. It doesn't just flow right by. Um, and, uh, the other thing is that a lot of this literature focuses on centralized forms of wastewater treatment. So you can imagine like a wastewater treatment plant. Um, that's where most folks, uh, tend to focus on this literature, whereas septic systems, um, occupy about 2% of pharmaceutical studies. Uh, and that's, you know, it's kind of an imbalance, um, yeah. because, you know, uh, you, when you think about it, but the U S uh, it's about 25%, of, 20 to 25% of the U.S. is on some form of uh, septic system or decentralized wastewater treatment. Really? Is that for, high? Wow. Oh, yeah. And ditto for Europe. Like, yeah. this is, these are, you know, still very common forms of wastewater treatment that are oftentimes less regulated or at least, oh, yeah. like, have less data on them. Let's yeah. say that. They have less data on them than a centralized form of wastewater treatment. Well, like, uh, Michael, we live on a farm, right? So our right. waste, our wastewater, uh, <clears throat> um, the one, the farmhouse has our ancient septic field, and mm-hmm. we actually have a pump out. We've got a septic tank and a pump out. So um, not to get too gross, but the solids, oh. the solids stay behind and the liquids get <laughs> pumped out, you know, a few totally. uh, ways away from the house and everything grows real nice over there and nobody comes to check it. Knock on wood. So right. <laughs> lots of fresh fertilizer for yeah. that, mom, for that yeah. algae. Yeah. Well, yeah. well it's, it's far enough away from the Creek. We don't think it affects it. We actually had to, like Chris, we had to have that looked at by some, some person that gave us the permit, right? Like it had to be. So yeah. many, okay. So it is sort of regulated like the- in Canada topography person yeah the topography had to person. be a certain had to be a certain distance yeah but i can imagine if you knew how to do it you could just build it in there if you were like a smart farmer and then nobody would know so hey yeah i derailed but, this i'm sorry doc oh you're totally good <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so the idea was you know you kind of use this we did that synthesis to be like okay what has the field done because this field is huge and it's growing quickly and so then this led into, okay, this, there's a whole literature that uses pharmaceuticals in rivers to track changes in ecological responses. And so we were wondering, can we do the same thing in lakes? Um, given that lakes have different hydrodynamics, they have different communi- or ecological communities than lakes, um, they have different chem- or, sorry than rivers, they have different chemistries than rivers. Um, so that's what we did. And that's really what the heart of Lake Baikal was, as well as my work at Flathead. Um, where we tried to relate those pharmaceutical concentrations, um, especially looking at like how human developments, human lakeside developments were along the shoreline. So like where were their homes? When were they occupied? Um, and then relate that to what we're seeing in the water column. And then what are the ecological communities that we see at each of those places? And how do the, you know, as we see differences in ecological communities, how do they interact with, with one? How do the members of the communities or the species that are there, how do they interact with each other differently? Um, mm-hmm. And like, just to, to synthesize that, I think, um, so here, oh, we're deep in, uh, I defended my dissertation in September. So we're, <laughs> we're digging into those deep we're, memory. We're getting in now. the weeds. <laughs> we're getting in the weeds, so to speak. Right. But um, the general synthesis is like, you know, when you get, um, when you get uh, an increase of sewage, right, or those sewage signatures like pharmaceuticals, 
Um, the algae are really good at like sucking up those extra nu- nutrients out of the water column, like we talked about. Um, so you really don't detect that nitrogen and phosphorus, but you do detre- detect the pharmaceutical. Um, and then that's usually associated with a growth in a certain type of algae. Those like green, you know, like if you've seen like in a, in a blue lake in the summer, it's usually like that green, like really filamentous, fibrous, mm. um, um, not like a, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to describe it. In well, a, I'll in tell a, you, it feels gross non- if you touch it. Yeah, it's very slimy. Yes. Super slimy. I fell off my, <laughs> Super we were slimy. at a lake and I fell into one off my paddleboard, um, right into it. <laughs> it felt like Sounds- giant spaghettis were going to eat my yep. legs. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> done, been there, done that. <laughs> um, you know, the thing, and so that's what we necessarily see. We see that type of algae becoming more abundant. Uh, we see certain macroinvertebrates that tend to be okay. You know, like they still stick around, some leave. Um, but I think the really interesting thing, you know, a lot of that that I've just discussed, you know, other people have suggested in other lakes that, you know, with sewage, these are the types of algae we would expect. These are the types of uh, invertebrates we would expect. Um, but what we tried to do is say, okay, given that change in the community, or ecological community, how does it ultimately change the food web and the way, or the way that those critters are interacting with one another? Um, and so they, basically the way it is, is those green filamentous things, algae, um, they contain a certain assemblage of fats or lipids um, that tend to be a little bit shorter than the really nutritious algae or the ones mm. that are, they grow quick, they grow slower. Um, they're usually, they're still slimy, (laughs) but it's the slimy stuff that's in like May or June, as opposed to the slimy stuff that's in August. And, um, those tend to grow, the healthy ones tend to grow a little bit, the more healthy ones tend to grow a little bit slower. Um, and when we, when we compare, when you can do is you can compare the lipids in the algae to the lipids in the invertebrates to get an idea of what they're eating. Um, and what we found was that even though the algae is changing in its lipid comp- compositions, you know, like the, gr- those green slimy ones are becoming more abundant, the lipids in the, the, the invertebrates actually reflect more like those healthy uh, algae. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Even though the food's changing, like how are they still getting the nutrition that they need? Hmm. Um, and we at least have a few different ideas of how this could go. Um, there's probably a range of things happening and more than one thing that's happening. Um, probably it's more like uh, at Lake Baikal or at Lake Baikal, they're able to dive deeper um, to where those gre- those like the, the, the green algae is less abundant. So they can, there's more healthy things. Um, but there's also potential cool mechanisms, or I think really cool mechanisms that might be abundant. Like those green algae, they're really hard and fibrous. So invertebrates tend to not like to eat them. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that there's parasites that can live inside of those types of algae and decay them. And the parasites actually produce, are able to break down that, um, that green algae and make it all mushy. And the parasite actually produces lipids that are similar to the really healthy ones. And so it might actually be that the inverts are eating decaying green algae, but because the parasite is causing it to decay and not be fibrous anymore, the parasite is actually upgrading those lipids. So it's making (laughs) it look like, oh, they're still getting the same nutrition. Um, so the long story long is that there's a lot of really complex mechanisms yeah. that we don't know, but like the, the main takeaway is that if you're looking for an organism that responds quickly to these types of sewage, you got to look to the algae community um, because the invertebrates are able to compensate somehow, even though that they're, or I'm not going to say somehow, cause we at least know the mechanisms. They're able to compensate um, through at least one of potentially many mechanisms um, even though their food is changing. Hmm. So well, sorry you know, for that if, long-winded response. No, that is, was, I it love it. seven years of work. <laughs> no, it's that, I love it. Like the long, long story short, a long story long. I like that long story long. I'm going to start using that when I'm teaching. Uh, we can test for pharmaceuticals in the water. We couldn't before. They're affecting mm-hmm. stuff and it's causing complex reactions, which create more questions than answers right now for you. Yeah, Totally. Cool. Well, that's what science is, right? Usually you, uh, yeah. you overturn a rock and you're like, well, what's that? 
<laughs> and you exactly, just got to keep going. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'd like to think of myself as pretty hearty, but if like my food changed to something that I didn't like to eat, I'd probably get a little depressed. Like oh, if yeah. I had to eat kale every day, I think I'd quit. I think I would quit because I hate kale. And um, Chris knows this because I've refused to eat it. It tastes like aspirin and it's spiky. So who, whoever thought we should eat kale was a weird person. Um, Can't help you with that one. Are, are you a kale person? You like <laughs> kale? Um, I've been known to eat some kale. Yeah. I've not been known to crave kale. Right? Is that fair? Yeah. Do you know? <laughs> do you know my favorite way to cook kale, Michael? Do tell. Well, you put a little bit of butter in the pan and you put the kale in there, so it slides right into the garbage. Right. That's how ah, the best way. Ah. Okay, okay, ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving on. Oh, oh, right. Let's uh, let's do a reset. I got so enthralled with what you're talking about and got a little goofy there. Um, we are chatting with Dr. Michael Meyer, who's a researcher ecologist, and we he just finished talking about how there's pharmaceuticals in the water and they're affecting the algae, which is this cascade effect throughout the ecosystem. Um, do you would you be able to talk a little bit about what you do with your uh, uh, the the new stuff you're working on? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. So sounds good. Go ahead, Doc. Um, do you also need to check hockey scores? Oh, I have been in the background. I cannot. <laughs> keep, it is ridiculous. I was like going to start. It is six three for the Avalanche right now, and they're oh, on. Well, yeah. yeah, and they're on the power play. I've been tweeting in the background through our account because I'm helping out this other um, service dog that it's a weird thing, but the, uh, this amazing lady, her name's Marla. She has a service dog named, um, Kuno and Kuno live tweets Oilers games. And we're helping tonight. So sadly the Oilers are down six, three, cause they're just playing like trash today. I think Bunsen, oh. Bunsen should go play net. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. They got, Duly shellacked. Noted. they got shellacked by the flames last seat, last, uh, round and they came back and just destroyed them. So it all, it'll all work out. We'll keep the faith. Okay. Fingers crossed. You know, <laughs> yeah. Good energy out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but yeah. So what I'm working on now, um, it really builds on, you know, um, if we all, what I was doing kind of at Washington state university, um, where, you know, we all have side projects, um, <laughs> call them the nights and weekends, um, things. And, and so, you know, the, the overarching trajectory is, you know, there's these, there's this ever expanding repository of, um, satellite imagery. Um, and I think, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on their name, but I think you had, a a spaces host or a guest a few weeks ago who talked about planet data months ago. Time uh, blends together. Dr. Jesse Christensen. I think so. Yeah. Are you talking they just, planets or plant data? Pla pla planet. Oh, planet. Yeah. Uh, it was satellite imagery. Uh, oh, Dr. Tanya Harrison. She works with um, the satellite imagery of Earth. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Planet, planet is called. Yes. Planet, yeah. yeah. The, so yeah, that's, um, so it's that type of, it's that space. Um, but the, the satellite, you know, there's a, a lot of like um, government satellites. So like the U.S. has the Landsat mission um, that's been taking images of the world since like the 1970s. Um, they, in European space agency, they have like the Sentinel missions. So there's all these different satellites, um, that are taking images of the world, uh, all the time. And these data are quite literally at our fingertips. Um, and the thing is, you know, folks like myself, a lot of folks like myself, freshwater scientists, we would love to work with these data. Um, but the thing is they're really hard to work with, <laughs> at least given the training that most freshwater scientists have. Um, so one of the thing, or, you know, we're, we're technically, we're usually not trained with the more computational background, let's say that, or data intensive background. Right. Um, so the, the thing that I've tried to do is make a lot of these data sets more accessible and more familiar and put them in formats that freshwater scientists like myself, um, are more accustomed to working with. So you can think of like, instead of having an image and being like, Hey, this is water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you can now have, um, like an Excel spreadsheet, right. Where it says your lake, the, the coordinates of your lake, the year or the time a picture was taken and like how much of your lake is seasonal water in surface area or like how much of it is permanent surface water area. 
Um, and it's that type of information where a freshwater ecologist can actually like do a lot of work. Um, you know, like if you think of the, the freshwater ecologist, um, the, who's been interested in fish population stocks, right? Like how do I know how much fish are in my lake? Well, they might be really interested in that seasonal water surface area because a lot of that seasonal water will be on the edge of the lake. And, you know, any good fisher people in this, in this, um, space probably knows that, you know, where there's lots of like dense vegetation at the edge of the lake, there's going to be like some fish breeding there at certain times of the year. And they like to hang out there. Oh yeah. That's where, um, you, that's where you catch all of the, uh, oh, what are they, what's the, what do we call them in Canada? Um, slough sharks. Um, oh, I have no idea what that is. Uh, what's the real, we call them <laughs> slew, uh, pike, but they're probably got, oh, pike. Yeah. They're, they're like, yeah. they live down in the weeds and you got to like, yeah, you lose so many yes. fish hooks trying to catch them guys. Right. And, and it's that information that could be so useful to a bunch of really talented freshwater scientists that might not necessarily have the backgrounds or the skill sets to work with those data. Mm. Um, so like, that's what got me into this. And, you know, I have my own science questions in and of myself or like what I would do with those data. Um, and so specifically what, you know, my project that I'm spearheading at the U S geological survey, um, which is um, in, I'm in the, the federal level of the U.S. Geological Survey. So um, basically there's this, we use these images of the nation or the world's actually lakes. And, you know, what we're trying to do is pair them with people who are take, pair those images with known sample collections, right? So like you can imagine if a satellite is going over, it takes a picture of the ground. What if like there was somebody that was sampling that lake at the same time. Oh, cool. And so we see like, oh, wow, this lake is really green. And then somebody took us a chlorophyll sample or like an algal sample. And we can relate that concentration with what the satellite actually saw. That is cool. So, and there's no way you can do that from the ground. It's just impossible. Um, I mean, you can. You can do that on the ground. Okay. Um, but if we want to get, you know, ultimately what gets, like I was saying, what gets me excited about science is um, working at big scales. Like I'm the person that always likes working at big temporal, like, you know, over decades and over like the size of a continent um, where there's ways that we know how to do where it could be pretty local for like one lake or one um, time point. But if you can imagine like the satellites are taking pictures of the whole world, like um, depending on the satellite, you know, every two days, daily, twice daily sometimes, mm -hmm. Um, and so we could use those pictures and that relationship that we built for like where we know the, 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 the concentration and the image to try to expand that insight across multiple lakes. Um, so like, for example, one thing that, that, that I'm leading is, um, there's this concept in freshwater science called nutrient color paradigm. Sounds really fancy, but I'm going to try to like explain it, uh, succinctly. <laughs> Where like basically there's like four types of lakes. There's brown lakes, there's blue lakes, there's green lakes, and there's this thing called murky lakes, <laughs> which is like right. It's it's a weird name. I still Ew. don't like it. I don't like it. It's like a lake that's both brown and green, um, but it's just called murky. Okay. Um, and but the idea is is like you know to a regular person that probably doesn't mean a lot. Like you say, oh well, it's a brown lake. But like to somebody who is a limnologist and limnologist being like study of inland waters, that's all that word means. Um, like the word, if I say, oh, this is, a, this is a blue oligotrophic lake, um, a limnologist will think of that and be like, okay, I immediately know what's the concentration of nutrients in that system. I know like what's the oxygen like in that system. I know the physics of that system. I know the food web, the chemistry, all of that information. And, but the, but all of it goes back to just knowing the color of a lake. Is it brown? Is it blue? Is it green? And so when I kind of pitched myself for this position, this post postdoctoral position, I said like, you know, if we can create these sort of statistical models that can take the color of a system and tell us the probability that it's like blue, green, or brown, you know, a freshwater scientist can like go way super far with that. And so it's a, it's a pretty like, I'm, I'm not going to say like basic cause I hate the word basic. Like a fu it's a fundamental idea of like, can we really merge these, the remote sensing technology that's been happening for like 50 years now, if we consider the Landsat imagery 
where we have, you know, for for especially since 2000, we have um, a 30 meter pix a 30 meter pixel image of the world every two weeks, essentially. Um, and then, can we use some of these local, like in situ, or these um, local samples to ultimately expand? You know, what proportion of across a continent, what proportion of a lake of lakes are blue and green and brown? And like, and how have they been changing through time? Oh, that is um, such a cool thing because then you get the progression on a massive scale. Exactly. Oh, okay. And you can, you know, and then you know, that's like the 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 first step, and then the second step is like, okay, like now that we're thinking of like, you know, so for example, for like fifty thousand lakes, we're we're doing this uh, across the contiguous U.S. And it's like, okay, where are the na- where are the blue lakes of the nation? Well, they're in like the Pacific Northwest. And they're in like the, the Northeast, right? And, you know, at least for a freshwater scientist, a lake scientist like myself, like that's not a surprising insight. Uh, what is a surprising insight is that like we can actually get that from an image and have like really good confidence of it. And we can look at it across scales um, to kind of like just understand how these systems are changing, especially because like it's so hard to sample these fre- these systems frequently. Yeah. Um, well, you don't have scientists at every single lake in the United States right. or Canada. That's a or lot. Even of, that's a person, a lo- let alone a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Of, have you been to Manitoba, Canada? It's literally 90% water and mosquitoes. <laughs> there is no way there's enough people there for all of the lakes uh, in Manitoba. Exactly. I don't know. Have you been to, have so you heard of the I, lakes in Manitoba? I, I, I well, I know the lakes intricately of Manitoba. I have oh, never been to Manitoba yeah, or I've, seen these lakes in person. <laughs> it is ridiculous. It is there are so many freaking lakes, and they're don't go too far north or you get eaten by polar bears and mosquitoes. That's that's Manitoba. <laughs> you are really selling this. I do. I try every time to get people to stay away from Manitoba. Um, sorry if people are in the chat from Manitoba. We are going to get unfollowed by them. But anyways. <laughs> Uh, so oh, I have gosh. one follow-up question before we get to mm-hmm. the audience. Um, what are glacial lakes considered? Because that's where I, like, they're really cold to swim in. Um, mm-hmm. But I love, uh, man, I love kayaking and paddle boarding on them. What color of lake would they be considered? Like a blue lake? Usually a blue lake. A blue lake? Okay. Usually. Okay. Um, some of them, you know, some of them might be a little brown, but like not like a, not like a super boggy lake. Mm. So largely blue. Yeah. Cool. Good okay. for paddle boarding and swimming. No, they're pretty cold, man. Yeah, you swim. You Oof. can't swim for too long in like the, <laughs> the the lakes that we go to in the Rocky Mountains. It's like straight off glacier. So, oh woof. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but on a very hot day, oof, ten minutes swimming in that, you are refreshed. Uh, <laughs> except for maybe Chris. I don't think she likes to swim in those lakes. What do you think, Chris? Uh, si tu bouge, c'est bon. Uh, if you move, it's okay. Okay, Miss Bilingual. Um. <laughs> Uh, Doc, are you okay with taking some questions from the audience? Yeah, totally. Okay, so the last little bit of uh, science chat, we always open up the floor to have some Q&A for our expert, uh, Dr. Michael Meyer. I think if we keep things on, uh, like if people have questions about Lake Baikal, this mysterious Mm -hmm. lake of Siberia, um, you probably could answer that and stuff about pharmaceuticals in the water or lake chemistry in general. Does that sound fair? Totally. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'm also happy to talk about satellites too. Oh, and satellites too. Right. <laughs> for okay, so for cr- water, not cr- for like physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Chris is working to bring some people up. Um, I think cause I am checking the hockey scores. Uh, it is six, three still stupid Oilers. Okay. Go ahead, Liz. Sorry. There was that lag there. Um, good evening, Dr. Meyer. Um, I, it's interesting. You're on, uh, side chat tonight because I okay I'm going to preface my question with two facts one this is an article from the Daily Mail and two it's about Florida so take both of those with a grain of salt but it's about fish testing positive for antidepressants prostate medications antibiotics and pain relievers as human wastewater makes its way out to sea so that in itself is horrifying don't we kind of recycle water the water cycle and that means that this stuff could end up in our water again or do you not know anything about that or do you just want to talk about the fish are happier <laughs> and they don't have prostate um, cancer and they, there you go <laughs> um wait, that's do, a great do, qu- wait do oh, fish sorry. even have prostates i don't know and he, i'm not a fish oh. biologist sorry michael 
Uh, neither am I. That's, okay, okay, that's we'll move going on. back into a recess of my mind that like, okay, I forgot you, about. Okay, you answer the question. I'm going to Google, do fish have prostates? Okay. Sure, great. Okay, teach their own. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, Liz, that's a great question. Um, and I think... So number one, yeah, that's uh, the the Florida specific case. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, but at least um, in general, yeah, there's a lot of literature out there about um, uh, biological accumulation of pharmaceuticals in natural systems. Um, And that's like even for like even the best wastewater treatment scenarios, you're still going to get some that go through and especially the ones um, that are fat soluble. So things there's, you know, there's the, there's the pharmaceuticals that will stay in water and there's some that like will accumulate in your fat. Um, you know, fish with certain type of fats, um, with certain life histories, they might be more prone to accumulate certain pharmaceuticals than others. Um, so, and actually one of the most foundational studies, uh, for, for this type of work, was on um, fish social so, social behavior or social like ha- basically looking at their social and behavior responses to pharmaceuticals or antidepressants actually um, you know some of the most prescribed drugs on the market and you know we know things that like they tend to be less social uh, with with um, when they are exposed to uh, uh, antidepressants um, they tend to be more jittery. Um, so like these, these are the, the sort of insights that we're getting, but like, you know, how scalable is it necessarily? Um, like, do, do we see, you know, just because we saw it in a lab, does it really happen in a natural system? You know, these are all things that are totally unknown right now. You know, I think the big insight is that number one, they can elicit a concentration in a lab at a concentration that we can observe in a natural system. So like, that's kind of, that's kind of big. And, um, and that they have, res- that there is a response, you know, I think like just knowing that there is a response and that it exists, um, is something that, um, is really, really, uh, big for this field. So that, that's interesting because antidepressants with people make them more social. So it's kind of like the, the opposite, but yeah. So it's been, right. they, they tested 93 fish an average of seven drugs. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, that's, you know, that, and and that's, you mentioned a big, a good point that it can be the opposite, right? Because we don't always necessarily know like how an anti or how like an antidepressant or how, um, uh, how does caffeine, you know, influence other organisms? And I would say I'm going to risk something here, but like more frequently than not, it's not the same response as we would normally see in a human, right? Um, and like you said, seven different pharmaceuticals, the thing I think that's important to keep in mind is that, you know, um, pharmaceutical developers are real, they design pharmaceuticals to work at a specific concentration, right? And, you know, if you go above or below that concentration, especially in the presence of another pharmaceutical, you can get a completely unexpected response. Um, and you know exactly what are those other seven, or what are the what are the other pharmaceuticals that that study didn't even test for that might be in the fish um, that might be giving us a response? You know that's that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, but you know, just the general disclaimer that I will also add is like I'm not saying by any means that folks should not take their medications. Please take your medication, <laughs> um, any kind of medication that you that you need. Um, I think the main takeaway from things like this is number one, like no the way you treat your sewage and the way that you dispose of your pharmaceuticals actually matter. Um, and they can have ecological consequences. Um, but please, like if you need heart medication, please take the heart medication. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. You've made me feel better about having a septic system in my house. Cool. (laughs) Hey Liz, uh, do you have time to forward me that I'd like to read more about it? Yeah. I'll send it to you in a DM. Okay. Thank you. If anybody's wondering, I searched, do fish have prostate? And the internet was very upset with me, but I did get to the bottom of it. It is the an only mammalian sex glands, but mm. not in echidna because they're weird, apparently. So there you go. Fish do not have prostates. <laughs> Echidnas are weird. They are super weird. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions for the doc tonight? That was a really great question, Liz. It is odd because um, the drugs that 
like the drugs that everybody takes, they go somewhere when we go. Right. 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 Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering like if it's worse around huge, massive cities, like, I don't know, comparable like New York to where we live. Um, or if it's harder to test cause New York's close to the ocean. Like there's all these other factors too, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's once again, a great question. Um, you know, at least I, I, I don't think number one there actually, no, there was a study, um, on something about this. Um, or at least adjacent, you know, but I think something that we're really missing good data on are septic systems, you know, like we know what's what wastewater treatment plants are like near larger cities. Um, Cause that tends to be well indexed. We know, you know, it's easily searchable, yeah. pretty easily searchable. It's not for like more rural or less oh. urban areas. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still a firm believer that it's like, even, even like pretty, uh, elementary septic system, it does something, right? You know, maybe it doesn't do the 99.5% like a wastewater treatment plant, but it does like 70 to 80%. Um, and like, that's at least better than, than putting, um, sewage directly into the ground. Yeah. Open right? sewage. Yeah. Open sewage. Definitely. Right. Yeah. A la, Cause like it, a la medieval times with the chamber bucket. Right. <laughs> or like even, even like, you know, like a cesspool type situation, <laughs> which is, yeah, well, but that's what you will see in, in, um, in Baikal or in Siberia, like, you know, in these towns of like villages of like 80 people, right. It's very cesspool oriented. Mm-hmm. And, um, cause like it's, it's Siberia, it's hard to get stuff there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but like, I think the thing is like the concentrations that we were measuring in Baikal, you know, they're super low. I want to just, I want to underscore that super, super, super low, but like at, the concentration on a per person basis is like equivalent to what you might observe, um, outside Seattle or Chicago. Um, and I think the main takeaway is there, it's like the way you process your sewage actually matters. Um, where, you know, even if it's a low population, you still have a low sewage signal, you know, maybe solution to pollution is dilution, right? But, um, but also, you know, wastewater treatments do like a really good job on average. Awesome. Who's our next speaker, Chris? Um, we, okay. So I just, I'm looking at the time and I want to honor oh, the right. time. That's right. It's 7.58. We have, uh, Paula, Kathy and Karen that I brought up to speak, but we have two other people who are, have requested. Okay. So we'll see what the time's like after we get through those speakers so we can honor uh, the doc's time. Well, thank you. Michael, is it okay if we go for another 15 minutes? Oh. Are you okay with oh, that? Oh, totally, totally fine. Okay. It's all good. So over, who was first, Paula, did you say? Or Karen or uh, Kim? Yeah, I said Paula, Kathy, Karen. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Mike. Nice to have you on tonight. Um, I have a general question. Um, Like, I almost was going to ask what Jason just asked, because would population would obviously affect all these pharmaceuticals in the water? Because you always see these advertisements, don't flush your medicine down the toilet, you know. Mm. But um, I was thinking, like, you know, you see these beautiful green lakes in Banff, and then you see things. I'm from Connecticut, so we have, you know, a lot of beautiful lakes up north in in, uh, Vermont, or even going up to the Superior Lakes in Michigan and such. Do you find that? You know, because those are a little bit, are they any more conservative in those lakes as far as having, you know, pharmaceuticals in them? Or is it, is it something that's going to eventually get them all? (laughs) You know, (laughs) because you kind of feel that, you know, there should be something to protect some of these pristine areas. And yet, um, look at the Cape because the Cape has got a really bad problem with their sewage and they had to have new regulations for all their septic tanks. So if you were trying to buy an older home, a lot of them, like you said, had these systems that were ancient and they had to be all totally upgraded. Hmm. So I just wanted to know what you felt about that. Um, That's a great question, Paula. And um, I think, you know, especially for lakes and, you know, like I was saying, a lot of this is such a new literature where it's, we don't necessarily have the data, right. To like make, I think a really informed decision. Um, 
But I think what we have learned is that, you know, pharmaceuticals are globally, or sewage pollution, pharmaceuticals are globally pervasive. Um, and it would not surprise me that like any system, you know, I, I don't like to say the word pristine, uh, just cause it's, I mean, that's just a me as a science person. Like I, I, you know, it's too squishy of a word, um, for me, but I, even like Siberia, right. We'll still find them with, you know, 80, 200, 600 people. Right. Um, and it would not surprise me, you know, you know, in Montana, right? Like outside Glacier National Park, there's a lot of people that visit Glacier National Park, but we still find pharmaceuticals at very low concentrations. So like, it would not surprise me, but we're really missing the the data to really, to really extrapolate like how prevalent are these um, at like a fine spatial scale. There's been some pretty good like coarse spatial scale. There was a really good coarse spatial scale study that came out in February, I think February of this year, um, that was really the most robust global synthesis of the pharmaceutical of pharmaceuticals in natural systems that I've seen. Um, but yeah, we're really data limited. And a lot of that goes back to just being so expensive and so time intensive to run these samples. Um, and I hate, I hate to say that because like, you know, everybody wants to like, no, or is my lake, <laughs> is there sewage in my lake or something like that? <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, you know, it, it it's, um, I'm a realist at some point, you know, how do we, we have finite resources. Um, how do we do the most with our finite resources? Right. And, and the fact of the matter is for like me to pro so when I was shipping the samples out, so for Baikal, we would ship them to a, a, a um, what do you call that? A lab that processed them for us. Um, a service lab, service lab. That's what, that's the term. And it was like $200 a sample. Right. Where like, if you wanted to take a sample, like, you know, <laughs> how frequently do you want it? It's going to be $200 a, uh, a pop. And that's one sample space and time. Whereas um, when I learned to process them myself, right, you know, it's Michael Meyer. It's not like a really fancy lab <laughs> doing it. Um, you know, I, we still did it. We did it well, but it, I got it down to like $40 a sample because my time was paid for by other things. Right. So it's really like the consumables that you're using in the machine or in the machine time. But like the, the, there's always that trade off, right. Of like, how, how do you learn to like get enough samples to get to the questions that you're interested in, but you're not like stretching your, your, your funds too thin for one of these things. Um, so sorry, hopefully that wasn't like a depressing answer, but like, I, but like the, the, I'll end on, well, if it is, remember they're just in the water. Right, right. <laughs> They're not in you, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's really the takeaway. The nice thing is that there are syntheses like this, and like caffeine, for example, is becoming way more common for testing. Um, so I think that there's a lot of hope moving forward, but we just don't have a lot of data to get there. Well, right well thank you very much. Hopefully, um, there'll be things that'll start to fund some of these, uh, you know, scientific studies, and, and hopefully, in the future, they'll, you know, be continued on and, you know, getting more funded. So that I'm, I'm, there's hope, as you like you said. So thank you very totally. much. I really appreciate it. Sure thing, Paul. Yeah, it's a pretty profound question to know what, how pervasive it is and how if it's affecting the ecology. So I agree with right. Paula. Yeah. And one more thing is, Paula, we also have a lot of data on like that you can, like I said, from the U.S. government, you can download it um, when there's a caffeine sample or something like that that's taken. Um, but the thing is, it's like uh, it can be a little biased because you tend to have more samples where things go wrong. Uh, we don't have a lot of samples for like there was nothing wrong in the system. So, um, you know, I think that that's that is very much an unknown of like for some systems that don't have problems or at least visible problems, what are the pharmaceutical concentrations like? And that's just not pharmaceuticals. That's like a lot of things. Okay. Uh, is it Kathy next, Chris? Uh, yeah. Kathy is next. Then Karen. Hi, Kathy. Hi there. Um, I am, I live in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes. Actually, <laughs> it's literally on our license plates. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and it's really more than that. And I'm fortunate enough to live on barely a lake um, in a suburb of the Twin Cities. And I'm wondering if you can help me distinguish between 
a brown lake and a murky lake. Because oh. our particular lake has golf course runoff into it. There's a small portion of a golf course on one end of this very tiny lake. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm wondering what the difference is between those two. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's a hard question to answer, even for like somebody that's, you know, like myself, that's spent a lot of time working with these types of things. Um, so the definition, like definition wise, they're, a br- oh, so a brown lake and a murky lake. Um, a murky lake would have more algae growing in it than a brown lake. So that's number one. Um, the way that you would like visually look at it, um, it's hard to tell sometimes, right? You know, visually, it's like there's lots of algae, but like there's also lots of maybe like sediment. Um, so like if there's a river that flows into it and the river's brown, it's like mixing with all of that. Um, so like murky lakes can be hard to identify um, by sight which is why from satellites, it's really hard. It's really, 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 really hard <laughs> to identify them by satellites. Um, and they're, um, sorry to interrupt you, Kathy. No, no. Uh, the, I think something that's cool with these murky lakes is that like, it's, it's kind of a new type of lake. Um, or it's, it's, it's a lake that like not a lot of people have thought about, let's say, um, because they behave completely differently than like brown lakes or green lakes. Um, they have oftentimes have more productivity, like more like algae, more zooplankton, um, critters in them than like a green lake, which is kind of bizarre for like a freshwater scientist to think about. We don't necessarily know why. Um, and, but they don't necessarily have like higher uh, level organisms. So they don't really have more fish. Um, but they do have a lot of zooplankton. Um, and it's kind of bizarre. And there's really a study, it was, and, you know, given that you're in Minnesota, I'm trying to like remember the distribution of like where these lakes usually are. And like Minnesota is probably in that range um, of like the Dakotas uh, and, and Minnesota um, of where we tend to see murky systems. And it's often associated with high sediment inputs, um, lots of, or um, high sediment inputs, as well as lots of fertilizer at the same time. Does yeah. that help at least? Oh, it helps a lot. We definitely have a lot of algae and a lot more growing on it than used to be. We Mm -hmm. used to have uh, many more water lilies and things. Mm -hmm. And yet we have egrets and herons and muskrats. Oh, cool. You know, we have um, two swans, white Mm -hmm. swans that live on it and um, Canadian geese. Thank you very much, Canada. Um, And ducks. (laughs) So we have a lot of wildlife in it, but it, it's really, it's, it's, a, I mean, it appears to be a mess. I just don't know if it is. Right. Um, so I'll just do a little more studying on it based, just look at some things, uh, look for some things to read. So thank you very much. I really yeah. love talk tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And like when I say they're new, like I remember there was a paper that came out in 2018 um, that really brought the attention of murky lakes into like the national context. Um, And I I remember a lot of folks when they read that were like murky lakes. That's not that's not one of the types of lakes. It's red, green and brown. (laughs) Or no, it's blue, green and brown. (laughs) And um, it's like, no, this is actually a thing. And those are, you know, among the the four classes that are growing, um, that are changing nationally. Um, murky lakes seem to be the one group that is growing the fastest and they're the hardest to track. Mm. Um, so, you know, they're still not common, not common by any means, but if you look at the proportion through time, um, they're the, the group that seems to be growing the fastest. Great. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Not a great marketing tool. If you, uh, have your lake denoted a murky lake, like come, (laughs) come to Lake Bunsen. It's murky. Oh, Everybody's yes. like, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't want to swim in a murky lake. Um, but there's probably nothing wrong with them. Uh, don't know. Future st- future restudy is needed. <laughs> Money, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we'll have only one more uh, question. And the, the there's two people that are requesting the mic. Um, Michael, would it be okay if they DM'd you their question? Sure. Is that okay? Sure. Do you have time? Sure, of course. Um, oh, Karen just dropped down. Uh She's gone. Okay. It was Karen, right? Karen was next. 
So, uh, so I had, it was Karen who was next. Yeah. Karen's, um, Karen's dropped off though. Okay. And then, um, it was Kimberly bond, but she's dropped down. And so now we have Dawn. Okay. So we can finish with Dawn's question then. Oh, and I have to let her talk. Yeah. So we're just bringing Dawn up to ask her question or their question. Hi. Hi, Dawn. How are you? We're good. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I, you may have answered me in my um, private message, but I was asking if the 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 uh, the water you were talking about, the kind of blue and slimy, if that's the um, the blue green algae that we're having so much trouble with with for dogs and um, the toxin. Yeah. So actually, so with, um, what I was referring to with the algae, it's not necessarily blue green algae. Um, these are really like, um, they're called, they're called green algae, not blue green. algae. <laughs> um, so they're, they're not toxic. Um, they're more, we call them like a nuisance algal nuisance algae, as opposed to a harmful algae. Okay. Um, so yeah, but, but, um, it's uh, the blue greens are relate. They're not phylogenetically related, but like it's the same um, process that you would get more blue greens where like, you know, you could imagine if there's a ton of sewage uh, entering the system, you might eventually get more blue greens, but these are specifically the green algae um, that seem to be really good at sucking up extra nutrients. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Kind of like how puppy beaker was more of a nu- nuisance than she was deadly. Oh. <laughs> Typical puppy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So to respect our guest's time, um, I think we'll we'll wrap up the space now. Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, Doc, thanks so much for joining us tonight for Science Chat. It was great to catch up with you again. Congratulations on your doctorate. It was oh, a thank fa- you. Fascinating discussion. Um, Again, like I said, I could listen to you talk about Baikal and the interactions of pharmaceuticals in the water for hours. Uh, so from, from our little family to you, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Thank you. Thanks, all, thanks to all folks for attending. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we had, we had a good discussion and lots of people attended. Uh, make sure you guys follow the doc. Just click on Michael Myers' profile and give Michael a follow. Um, so that's it for Science Chat tonight. Saturday is Pet Chat. So we run two live spaces a week. Saturday is uh, at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. We play games. There's sometimes a prize. And we chat about the dogs, cats, and pets that people have. You know, I did not... I'm not prepared. I forget who we have next week for the guest. Chris, do you remember? Do you remember me talking about it? No. Okay. No, I am been... OC, like, obsessed with the Marching Show Band Classic. All right. The, the Marching Show Band Classic is this this uh, Sunday. The big show, show band thing in right here. Oh, I got it right here. Here we go. I got it. Um, so our guest, our guest next week in Science Chat. Oh, it's uh, Daniel Bush. Uh, <gasps> yeah, Daniel awesome. Bush is back. Yeah. Um, I'm sure yes. We'll, I'm sure we'll be able to talk chemistry and football with her. So make sure, you co- make sure you come next Tuesday. Daniel's awesome. Okay, it's, Thank you so much for coming to uh, Science Chat tonight. You could be anywhere in the world, and you're here listening to science. And once again, thanks thanks to our guest, Michael Meyer. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care, everybody. Be kind to each other. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Space closing in three, two, one. I was waiting for the meow. What? The meow? Yeah. We don't have the, a meow. You need the meow at the end. <laughs> was that go. you? No. That was Paula. I think that was Paula. That was me. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs>